Hello, everybody, and greetings from the Delta College Planetarium. My name is Brian, and I'm here to bring you another episode in our continuing series about the constellations. We're nearing the summer solstice again here in Michigan, so we'll turn our attention back to the summer sky. Remember that the set of constellations that straddles the path of the sun through the background stars is called the zodiac. They are a set of 12-ish constellations that encircle the sky. The zodiacal constellations are among the best known because of their role in astrology. Astrology and horoscopes are complete junk, by the way. The distant stars cannot influence one's life in the way that astrologers profess. But they are still very popular and people can still form emotional attachments to the constellations associated with their birthday, so I want to make sure that we cover all of them. Today we go back to fill in a gap in our summer zodiac. We've previously explored the spring zodiacal constellations Cancer, Leo, and Virgo. And last year, we took a closer look at two of the summer constellations, Scorpius and Sagittarius. The missing constellation lies between Virgo and Scorpius. It's called Libra, the scales or balance. Libra is the only member of the zodiac that represents an inanimate object, and not an animal. It can be a little difficult to see because the stars of Libra are not particularly bright, I usually try to find Libra by seeking out this tall, thin triangle resting on its point. The stick figure for the scales actually uses another triangle located at the top of the constellation, and then by two lines descending from the lower points to connect to the pans on the scales. Libra is home to essentially no interesting deep sky objects easily seen in amateur telescopes. So instead, I want to tell you about one of the stars in Libra. This star is named HD 14283. It's an unassuming 7th magnitude G0 class star, a little hotter than our sun, and about 200 light years away. You would need a telescope to see it, but nothing about it would really set it apart from the other stars in the field of view. It's a sub-giant star, a sort of in-between category. The star is evolving from its stable main sequence form, like how our sun is now, into a red giant, like the bright star Arcturus. None of that would distinguish HD 14283 to the eye. But that star is the oldest star we've discovered. Estimates put HD 14283 to be about 14.46 billion years old, with an uncertainty of about 800 million years. That number may already make your eyebrows rise. The Sun is only about 5 billion years old, so this star is nearly three times as old. But also, our best estimate for the age of the universe is 13.76 billion years old, with an uncertainty of only about 40 million years. Is HD 14283 older than the universe? Probably not. The high uncertainty in the age of the star means that while those numbers look to be in conflict, there is still significant overlap in those timeframes. Our ability to date stars is simply not precise enough yet to fully eliminate the conflict. What is obvious is that HD 14283 must have formed very quickly after the Big Bang. This is further supported by the composition of the star having very little metal. Astronomers use the word metal differently. You're probably used to thinking of metals as things like iron or copper or titanium. In this field of astronomy, metals are any element heavier than helium on the periodic table. This includes elements like carbon, oxygen, and neon, things you wouldn't normally call metals. HD 14283 has only about 1 250th the metals present in the sun. This points to the conclusion that HD 14283 is a relic from a previous generation of stars. We believe that our universe has seen three generations of stars created within it, from about 10 seconds to 20 minutes after the Big Bang. The universe was dense enough and hot enough throughout its entire extent that nuclear fusion took place. Hydrogen fused into helium and small amounts of lithium and beryllium. The theory predicts that at the conclusion of this era, the matter in the universe would be about 75% hydrogen and 25% helium by mass, with trace concentrations of other elements. When we examine the universe, what we find matches these expected concentrations very closely. 
So where did all of that oxygen you're breathing in, or the carbon in the tree outside, or the copper in the computer you're using to watch this video come from? Well, it formed in the cores of stars. The first stars would only have that hydrogen and helium of the early universe available, so they would have essentially no metal present in them at all. We think these stars were huge, hundreds of times the mass of the sun. They would have burned hot and fast, fusing hydrogen into progressively heavier elements until they exploded as tremendously powerful supernovae, only a few million years after their formation. None of these first-generation stars are thought to survive today. Those supernovae would seed the clouds of gas and dust in the universe with the first amounts of elements like carbon, oxygen, and iron. As those clouds collapsed and formed stars of their own, the new stars would have some metal in them. These stars were still on the large side typically and lived quite quickly as well, but their supernovae would be a little less dramatic and a little more able to disperse a wider array of heavier elements like gold and silver through their depths, seeding the universe for the next generation of stars, of which the sun is a part. The reason the Earth is here, the reason you are here, is that the generation of stars that includes HD 14283 built heavier atoms in their core and then distributed them around the universe. These atoms could then form more complex and varied molecules, some of which became alive. All life is the product of those stars. So if it's clear where you are tonight, go out and try to find Libra in the southern sky, and try to imagine the epic of those generations of stars and supernovae that enriched our universe with their atomic products. That's it for today. Next time, we'll take a look at another summer constellation. This is Brian from the Delta College Planetarium, wishing you clear skies. <laughs>